Anyway, uh, the first thing I thought I would talk about is Lightroom in general and kind of how it works. Because I think there's sometimes some confusion amongst people that when you have photos in Lightroom or you import them into Lightroom, they are actually in Lightroom. And that's not the case. Your photos live on whatever drive and whatever folder you choose to put them. So let's do a very quick mock import here so you can kind of see the process, at least my process. Uh, there are other ways to do this and I will mention maybe some of those as well. But right now I've got some images out on a flash drive that's plugged into my computer. So I'm gonna come down here to import. That's the method. Now that probably is why there is confusion sometimes about why people think the photos are in import or are in Lightroom because we use the term import. All you're really doing is you're, you're telling Lightroom where those photos live. Now, in this particular case, they are outside the computer. They're on this USB drive right here, the ones I'm gonna be bringing in. They're in a subfolder here and I made this little folder and I have a couple photos in what's called raw files. That's just the name I gave it. And you're seeing these photos that it's suggesting that it wants to, to bring in and copy to a location that I would designate. Hence you see copy up here at the very top. You also have the option to copy them as DNGs. Right now, because I shoot a Canon camera, my photos are CR2 files. That is the raw designation. Nikon files, I believe, are NEF. Uh, and there are other extensions for raw files from other types of cameras. You can bring in JPEGs if you choose. Uh, there are many different file types you can bring in. But back to what I was saying about DNG. DNG stands for digital negative, And it is a raw file type that Adobe came up with with the idea that maybe as some of these other camera manufacturers changed um, their, their way they, they describe a file, that DNG would be something they would stick with. At one time, I did convert files as I brought them in with DN, two DNGs from the CR2s, but I've never really found any great advantage in doing so, and it just added an additional step. So I don't, I bring in the CR2s as they are. Now, something else that I will point out as we look at this is you're seeing, eh, what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, uh, 13 photos that are up here right now, it's suggesting to bring in. But there are more that are on that flash drive. And the reason you're not seeing all of them is this little checkbox, where is it? Here, don't import suspected duplicates. What Lightroom will do is it will take a look at the files you are suggesting that you're gonna bring in or add to Lightroom. And if there are duplicates, if this box is checked, it won't show them. Pay attention to what happens when I uncheck this box. Many more come in, but these are already on the drive. So if I was to bring these in now, uh, I would have duplicates. So this box is a nice feature to have. Don't import suspected duplicates. So we'll do that. The next thing you would do is you wanna tell it, okay, these photos are on the USB drive in this particular case. Uh, you might have them on an SD card or something else that you put in your card reader after you took it out of your camera and so forth. So, you'd bring them in that way. The next thing you're gonna do is say, okay, I wanna bring these images and add them to Lightroom. In this case, copy them from the USB drive to a hard drive. And where do I wanna put them? So I'm gonna bypass some of this information up here. I already told you about the don't import suspected duplicates and I don't wanna spend a lot of time on this. Most of you, if you're using Lightroom, have already figured this out. So we'll skip that. I'm gonna collapse this apply during import. This destination is important and you'll notice in the subfolder. On my particular computer, I put all my photos 
into this drive. And that's just one of my external drives. I happen to have named it T and I have a sub a folder under that called photos. And so out of my T drive in the folder called photos, that's where they live. The next thing I would do is I come up, put a check mark in this into subfolder, and then I make the name of whatever I want to name that folder. Usually it's based on uh, the location for me. Some people like to use a date convention. Uh, I don't. I prefer to use, just use a name convention. And so this particular thing has, happens to be a hodgepodge of photos and I'm just doing it for demonstration purposes. So I'm, I'm probably not gonna actually bring them in, but I will uh, kind of walk through it. So say I wanted to name this Rick's uh, BCC test files. Okay, so if I did that, now when I go ahead and hit the import button, what these are going to do is it's going to copy these off the USB drive into this photos folder in a subfolder called Rick's test files. So that is the method by which you get images off an external source onto a hard drive and make Lightroom aware of them. But say I already had the photos out on a drive somewhere elsewhere. And I know other people, this is what they do. And the reason I want to show you this is because it brings in something different than copy. Let's make believe I've got some photos out, uh, not on the C drive, in my particular case, my desktop, which... I tend to throw a lot of stuff on the desktop. It seems to wind up there. I got to hunt for it a little bit sometimes. It's down here. Uh, desktop. Okay. And we're going to leave the don't import suspected duplicates. And it's finding all kinds of stuff out on the desktop because, like I said, I've thrown a lot of things onto the desktop and it's still beginning to populate this, this list here. So I'll let it do that while we're talking. So these photos are out on my desktop. They have not been brought into Lightroom yet because notice I have the import suspected duplicates. But up here, what it's doing is it's suggesting I add them. And the difference between add and copy is add says, okay, these images already exist out on a drive. All I'm doing is now making Lightroom aware of them. So I would use add and now nothing moves, nothing changes, none of the files um, are copied or no more drive space is incurred. All I'm doing is saying, okay, Lightroom, these exist at this location and now you're aware of them so that I can begin to edit and work with them. So hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, that's about where I wanted to go with that. It certainly goes a lot more. I'm not going to execute it, but the, the whole reason I bring this up is to hopefully, hang on a second here. I want to do something. I'm flying blind at the moment. Let's cancel this and turn that off. There we go. Okay. I got you guys back up on the screen. So hopefully again, thumbs up. This is all coming through, correct? Good, David, thank you. Um, so we're back to that screen. So that's the idea between copy the images off an external drive as you bring them in for the first time to your computer from an external source versus add photos that are already existing on your drive. Now, Something else I wanted to get into, and you will run across this, is you may find photos that all of a sudden you will find um, a question mark or on the folder itself an exclamation point. And what's happened is Lightroom has lost track of where the images are. And if that happens, what you probably have done is moved the photos with something other than Lightroom. If, you, if you're in Windows, 
You might have used Explorer to move them. Uh, I don't know Max well, but I believe people move folders, files around with the uh, Finder is the tool. I'm, again, I don't speak Mac, but I think that's the case. But anyway, I describe Lightroom as, as what I would call a jealous secretary. Uh, and the reason I use that term is because, I'm gonna switch this off for a second. Uh, the reason I use that term is because, like a secretary, what Lightroom does is it does not change any of your images or anything else. It simply keeps notes about what it's doing, like a secretary would keep notes. So if you do something behind the secretary's back, you use a tool other than Lightroom to do something, the secretary doesn't know what you did and therefore the files get lost, at least to Lightroom. The thumbnail will still be there because that's what it created, but Lightroom will have lost track of those files. So let me show you what I'm talking about. Let's see if we can get back to Lightroom again. There we go. All right, let's do something purposely. Um, let's come down here into photos. Here's an old folder that I did back in 2017 called 25 Days of Santa. Now, say for whatever reason, I did not want this on this T drive. I wanted to move it to my desktop. I can do that if I use Lightroom to do the move. So let me get back to where my desktop was uh, under the F drive here and there. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this folder 25 days of Santa and I'm going to click and hold and drag it up to my desktop and drop it there. And it's going to say, you're going to move the files on the disk. Is that okay? Uh, so forth. And I'm going to say, yep, go ahead. And it's going to move those files. Notice all these files out on my desktop with question marks on them. That's because Lightroom, I probably moved things around since that was initially done and it's lost track of where those files went. But now under the desktop, this 25 days of Santa is out there and Lightroom knows exactly where it is because I used Lightroom to move it. Let me show you what happens if I use something else to move it. Let's move it back where it was going to drag it back down. Uh, lost my place. Where are we here? Oh, that's the desktop. We need to, I got too much stuff on the, there we go, down to the T drive and here on photos, let it go. And that moves it back. Um, okay. So now let's take and I'm in the folder, I'm gonna right click this and say, uh, now let's do it with Explore. I was gonna do it a different way, but let's come in, hang on a second here. Got all kinds of stuff going on here. Bear with me, maybe I shouldn't have gone down this rabbit path. Okay, I don't know if you can see my desktop. I hope you can. Let's, I don't know what you're seeing now. David's shaking his head. Let's share the screen and Oh, da, 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 da. Okay. We'll go back to Lightroom. Okay. Hopefully you're seeing Lightroom. Um, okay. Let's do it this way. Show and explore. Okay. We're seeing Lightroom again. Okay. What I'm going to do is this first photo, I am going to move this photo. You can't see this because it's on another screen, but what I'm going to do is move this to the desktop. And then we're going to, okay. 
Now, look, hopefully you're seeing what I want you to see. Okay, you're seeing the desktop, you're seeing the very first photo, and now it has this little exclamation point. And when I hover that, it says the photo is missing. The photo is only missing to Lightroom. The photo is not gone, but because I used Explorer to move it, Lightroom doesn't know where it is anymore. The thumbnail's here. I can come in, I can play around with it, but the photo is not where it's expected to be. So if I come to the exclamation point and I click it, it says, this can't be found because the original file isn't there. Would you like to locate it? And I'm going to say, yes, locate it. Somebody is unmuted and I hear their speaker. Um, so now I'm going to say, yeah, it went out to the desktop. And it's here. And I think it was this first one. And I'm going to say select. And it's not, I didn't pick the right one because let's see, original file, day 24. All right, let's try that again. It pay more attention. It's that one. No, I still don't have it right. 25 days of Santa day 24 TIFF. Uh, oh, the JPEG, that's why it's not. Okay. Well, that's not where it wound up anyway. It probably is not in a folder. It, there it is. So I say select. And now the exclamation point has gone away and it has found it again. So moral of the story, I don't want to spend too much time on this. We're going to move on to something else is if you're going to use Lightroom to do your work, Use Lightroom to do your work. Do not move things around with Explorer or Finder or anything else. Lightroom is what's called a digital asset management tool. Sometimes they abbreviate that and call it a DAM. And, you know, so use the DAM program and that's what you should do and you won't find things missing. So if you got any questions about that, um, Oh, Giuseppe says, what if you don't know where you move the picture? Then you're going to probably need to use whatever diagnostic tools you have to hunt it down, whether that's Explorer for Windows users or the Finder in Mac. And once you find it, then you can lash it back up again and tell it where it is. But you won't have the problem if you do what I say and don't use things other than Lightroom to move files around. Well, that's the moral of the story. It will happen. Uh, I have seen people, and probably I've even done this myself, where folders and multiple folders all of a sudden disappear from Lightroom. You saw the ones on my desktop, and that's why I, you know, use the desktop for temporary things, but don't really do serious work with Lightroom with it because it's too easy to move things around and lose the, the path. So, uh, David, everyone, what's the best way to delete a file when you're in Lightroom? Okay, let's, that's easy. Let's go back to share screen and what happened to Lightroom? There we go. Okay. So, Let's go, let's go here. Okay, say this photo right here, this uh, IMG 421, hopefully you're seeing that. If I wanna delete it, I right click it and I click remove photo and it's gonna give me two options. It's gonna say, do you wanna remove it from Lightroom? This, this wasn't a good pick and the reason being is this is probably one that's on the thumb drive so it, that, let's pick, see if I can pick something else. Let's pick this first one to see if it gives me the same problem. Right click it, remove photo, there we go. All right, 
this is the option you will get if you right click a photo and you decide you want to remove it. You, if you hit delete from disk, it will be gone. Gone, gone. Both off the hard drive and out of Lightroom. It will still remain in your trash folder. So you do have a chance to get it back if you go, oh no, I didn't mean to get rid of it. But use this first one with caution. This next one, remove, will remove it from Lightroom paying attention to it. It will no longer show up in Lightroom, but it will still be out there on your drive. So that's the difference between the two. And you can do this with multiple folders or files. If I wanted to delete all these in the, in the top row, I can select them all, click the first one, shift click the last one, right click, remove photos, and it gives me the same option. It tells me I've selected five and I get delete from disk or remove. So, so that's how that works. Okay. Enough of that. Let's move on to the next thing. Uh, I had, uh, this was a question from Mary, who I see in my screen there. And Mary wanted to learn about collections and what are collections and how do they work and so forth and so on. Turns out tonight, I am going to be working with photos in collections. You'll notice I'm in the library module. Here are all my folders. Let's collapse that. And I have collections. And if I open that up, here are a bunch of collections I have. What is a collection? A collection is simply pointers to the photos. They, it doesn't duplicate the photos. It doesn't do anything else. For instance, let's use an example. I could have a collection called Boise Camera Club members, and I could have a list of all you people, and I could even have pictures of all you people, but those would simply be pointing to you at your address wherever you live. You don't, you don't move because you're on my list of pictures. The same with these. If I go in, let's uh, pick a particular one, and you'll see here one of the ways I use collections is when I'm getting ready for the fair, say back in 2014, I wanted to go through my, all my drives and, and designate some photos that I might want to enter in the fair. I didn't want to move them from the folders where they existed. I simply wanted to create a collection of the images. So I made this collection and then I'm going to show you how you get photos into a collection. And then we're going to talk about what's called smart collections, which is a, a slight variant. So say I want to make a collection. I come over here to the plus sign, click plus, and I click create a collection. And let's just, again, I could name this whatever I want. It depends on what the collection is going to be. We're just going to call this Rick's test collection. Okay. And let's talk about some other things that are here. If I use this one, I can have a collection nested inside another collection. So I could have, uh, say I had a, a collection called Nature, and within the Nature collection, I had a sub-collection called Flowers. That might be example of a collection inside. If I had already selected photos, I could say, so use those photos that I've already selected to start this collection. I'm not going to do that right now, but this one set as target collection can be very useful and I'll show you why. I'm going to click that and I'm going to say create. And now under collections, if I was to scroll down here and you can see I use collections quite a bit, there should be one called Rick. There it is right there, Rick's test collection. And it has a plus sign next to it. And the plus sign tells me that that is a, the targeted collection. Okay, so it's just sitting there waiting to receive photos from other places. So let's come back up here. We're going to get out of collections. We'll come into folders and let's come in. Eh, 
let's come into um, the sparkler photos here. Why not? Okay. Say now I want to put some photos in that collection. And I say, I want this one. And I right click it and I say, add to target collection. And I come to this one and I right click it and I say, add to target collection. And you'll notice as I do that, it's saying, okay, added to target collection. It's not moved the file, it's not copied the file, it's not done any of those things. And now I can come to a whole different folder. Let's come down here to this one. And I go, oh, okay, let's add this one to the target collection. Let's add this one to the target collection. Or I can pick multiples. I, let's pick this whole row, right click it, and add it to the target collection. Okay, here's another trick I just learned. Let's see if I can actually do it. Um, this little spray can down here, the painter, if I click it, and then I choose what it does, see it says target collection. Now, my little paint can, I can treat like I'm tagging things. So I can say, add that one, add that one, add that one. Or I can, like a spray can, hold the button down and say, add all those if you saw me swipe across that. So let's see what's been happening behind the scenes as I've done that. Down in collections, in, where'd it go? Rick's test collection, there are now 15 files. And there they are. And you'll recognize some of them because those are the ones I added to the target collection. So a collection is simply photos that live in other places that you haven't moved from where they originally live, they can be from multiple random places and you can put them in a collection. So, you know, let's look at, you can just look at some of my collections and see, let's see, are those collections? Yeah, you can see how I'm using them. You noticed every year when the fairs come along, I go through a bunch of my different folders and I go, oh, yeah, that might be a good one to put in the collection. Oh, that one might be good. And they can just, you know, I can add them as I go. And they just show up in a collection. So that's handy. Or, you know, let's see what else I have. Okay, this one, Ballet Best. Say I shoot a bunch of the photos of the ballet, and now I want to make a collection of what I think are the best photos from that session. I can tag those all and put them in a collection. Nothing's moved, nothing's copied, no more space on the file drive. They just show up in the collection. The other thing that's interesting about collections is say, I'm gonna put my paint can back. Say I want to edit this one. I don't have to go to the original folder. I can abstract here. I can treat it just as if it was in its native folder. I can develop it. Let's do something drastic so that you can tell a difference. Let's turn it black and white. And now that file, even though it is in the collection, the original image is changed as well. If I right click this and say, go to folder in library, and it goes to where it really lives, and I open that up, there it is in its place where it really lives in this DPS watercolors folder. And it's black and white because I changed it not here, but I changed it in the collection, if that makes sense. Okay. So hopefully we haven't lost you. So now let's talk about smart collections. Okay. If you come here, you have the ability to create a smart collection. There will be some smart collections that are already in place in Lightroom for you that it creates. So you'll notice down here, I have smart collections. If I open that up, here are some of the various ones I've created. Uh, you may have some other ones. For instance, all the photos I've shot in the past month, all my four star photos, all, you know, whatever. Okay. How does a smart collection work? Let's dissect one a little bit. I think I might, okay, here's a good one. 
good example. Flower photos. I created that and I'll show you how we create it. I'm going to right click it and I'm going to say edit the smart collection because I want to let you see what's under the hood. So what it does is I make a definition of the smart collection. In this case, I said I want to include in my, my collection called flower photos any of the, the images that match these conditions. And these conditions that I set up where the keyword has the word flower in it, and I've put that in there, and the rating is greater or equal to four. So what I'm gonna get are all my four star photos that have the keyword flower. Now, what makes that a smart collection? First of all, you've defined the conditions. Second of all, as you go through in your normal work session and you create, a say tomorrow I go shoot a new flower photo and I think it's a good one, so I give it four stars and I give it the keyword flower, now automatically Lightroom will add that to my collection without me even having to do it. So, you know, back to the fair analogy, say I give, I, I create a smart, let's, let's make believe we're going to do one just so you can see it. Let's come here. We're still under collections. I'm going to hit the plus sign. I'm going to create a smart collection. Okay, let's call this um, 2020 Fair Candidates. We have a fair this year. All right, I'm not going to, I'm going to leave this checked. We're going to leave it under the Smart Collections set. So this will be a folder under the Smart Collections called 2020 Fair Candidates. Now I come and set my conditions. I can choose whatever conditions I want. I'm going to say, all right, in order to be eligible for my 2020 fair collections, I want a rating greater or equal to four stars. I only want to see my good photos. And if I hit the plus, then I can say, and the keyword where keywords in here somewhere. Oh, any searchable text is what it calls it. Doesn't call it keyword. Any searchable text contains 2020 fair. Okay. Now, as I begin to go through my session, anytime I make a four star photo and I put 2020 fair as a keyword, it will automatically show up in the collection. Let's, let's expand to look at a different idea of how you might use it. Say you want to see all the photos that you've brought in in the, lap, in the past month. So here is the definition for that. The capture date is in the last month. The capture date is in this year. And the file type is not video. And that's just what I set up for that. So now this particular smart collection always is showing me all the images that meet these conditions. And Lightroom is constantly updating that. And this number will change depending on whatever photos at the time meet this condition. Uh, if you want to dig into this further, the article that I just did for uh, Digital Photography School, some of you know I write for them, uh, really gets into this in depth. So I will point you to that. There's a link on the club page. So if you want to learn about collections and smart collections and using Lightroom to search for files and all those good things, I will recommend that article to you. So that's how much time I want to spend on that. Let's get into the next thing. Speaking of collections, let's come out of here. I made a collection for tonight, so I wouldn't have to look around for photos that we're going to use. You'll see all these people pictures, and I'm going to get back to those in a second for another question. But right now, I want to scroll down to this photo. 
and I'm going to come into the develop module. I had a question posted on the Facebook page by Linda Weiss Helvey. Uh, Linda, I hope you joined tonight. There you go. I see your name there. So you asked if I would go back through using luminosity masks. And so let's talk about that. Uh, we did this once before, but it probably bears a reshow because it's, it's a concept to get your head around. So this is the after photo on here. Uh, the before photo, if I hold down the backslash key, looks like that. So that's where it started. That's where it finished. Okay. So let's show how we got from here to here. While I'm at this spot, I had a question from somebody, I think it was Joyce this week, said, I accidentally got into the before and after using this tool down here, and then I didn't know how to get out. How did I get back? Well, there's two ways to get out. Very simple. This first one is what's called the loop view. And you'll also notice next to it, it has the letter D. So if you find yourself here in before and after, and you're going, oh, I need to get back to just one picture, you can either click this or you can click the D key and you're back. So Joyce, I don't know how many, don't feel bad because I know many, many times uh, there's some simple thing that is a one keystroke fix and I just agonize and beat my head on the wall and go, how do I do that? And I can't figure it out. And so I have to, you know, go online and search for the answer. But okay, this is the after. If I want to get back to the before, I'm going to hit reset. And now you'll notice that picture actually started out as a, a vertical orientation, portrait orientation picture. So let's very, very quickly go through an edit. I'm going to move pretty fast to get to the spot that you want. So basic workflow for me, lens corrections, check these two boxes. I want both those on go to basic. I always click auto. Why not? If it's going to do a good job for me, I like it. Yeah, it got us part of the way there. It looks better. think it could use a little more exposure. Um, so forth. Now let's go ahead and crop it. On the crop tool, I want to change this. I don't think I need all this stuff down here or all this stuff up here. When I'm in the crop tool, if I want to switch from a portrait aspect ratio to a landscape aspect ratio. While the crop tool is selected, if I hit the X key on my keyboard, that changes it. And the aspect ratio will be what's ever here. Right now it says original. You'll notice if I click on that, I get other type, other aspect ratios. So now if I was to crop that, notice the height and width stay proportional. They stay in the original, which is the four by six aspect ratio. If I want to make it maybe more landscape or something, what I can do is this little lock, if I unclick the lock, now when I grab, notice I can make this non-standard -as aspect ratios. And so if you ever start to scale your picture and you notice it's getting strange and you're going, wait a minute, what's going on? Take a look and make sure that the lock is either unlocked if you, that's what you want to do or locked if you want it back. I'm going to put this back to four by six and put this how I like. So say I'm happy with that. We'll crop it in. All right, here's where we were headed. And, um, Linda, this is what you asked about luminosity masking. If we were out shooting this in the field with a dark foreground and a bright sky, we might put a graduated neutral density filter on our camera. And if you've seen those, they look like a piece of glass, sort of like the windshield on your car where you have the dark band up at the top sometimes, and then it fades to more clear glass. And it looks like that. And the reason people use them is they want to darken the sky and still maintain the, the, the ground. But the problem with them, and, and a good example here, is if I pick the graduated filter, 
And I bring the graduated filter down. Right now I've got the exposure up. Let's bring that down and let's purposely bring this down so you can see. In fact, I'm gonna do this again because I wanna show you something else. Say I want that to be level across the screen. When I bring the filter down and you don't have to necessarily start at the top. I used to think you had to start at the top and drag it clear down from the top, but you don't. What you can do is put your cursor about where you think the middle of it should be. And now I'm going to hold down the shift key and I'm going to click it. Hello. Come on. Oh, there we go. All right. One there. Oh, well. Anyway, I don't know why that didn't work but you can see the graduated filter. That darkens the sky, probably a little too much. I'm gonna back that off to where I go, oh, I like the sky better, but the problem now is it's dark in the mountains too. And that's exactly what would happen if you used a real graduated glass filter over your lens out in the field. So we don't want that. We want the mountains to stay the same, but we want the sky to be darker. So how do we deal with that? If I scroll down here a little bit, you see what's called range mask. And right now it's off. Let's turn it on. I have the ability to choose color, luminance, and depth is grayed out. New cameras uh, that are coming out would actually record information that would say I could make a difference between what's close and what's far. But most of you are not gonna have that and most of you are gonna have depth grayed out. So we won't even go there or talk about that one. The one you will more than likely use the most is luminance. So I'm gonna turn luminance on and now I'm gonna click this one and let it show the luminance mask. And you'll notice where the mask is turns red. Okay, we know that underneath of that, let's turn this back off for a second, the sky is brighter than the rocks. So we want to mask the brighter portions and not the darker portions. So let's turn that back on. Okay, this range scale, this end, the low end to the left are the darks. This end are the lights. And so what we wanna do for this particular picture is preserve the lighter colors, which means I want my range to stick to the lighter color. So I'm gonna drag from this end. And notice when I start to do that, the red starts coming off of the mountains, but stays on the sky. If I want to tune that a little bit more, I can come down to the smoothness and do that. And I can continue to adjust this to get what I want. And now it's pretty much off of the mountains, but because of this spot up in the sky was close to this in color, it's not there. So if I say, gee, I really want that to be affected too. I can get my brush and not this brush, but you'll see the word brush down here. These are easily confused. They're not the same. If you're working with a tool and you have applied a mask, this is the one you want, brush. And now when I get my brush, uh, let's see, I need to... Hit erase, not erase. There we go. That should be, why is that? Something's not right. Maybe I didn't want that. This is when you talk to yourself. Um, let's go to this brush. Hello? Your computer's choking. I hate it when that happens. Okay. Back to the drawing board. Uh, okay. All right. When things go wonky, come to the history and let's come back down to here. Okay. And we'll start again and see what happens. There is my mask, exposures down, 
Come to the range mask, luminance, luminance mask. Bring that down to get it off the hills. Smoothen this up a little bit. And brush. Hmm. I don't know. All right, we won't worry about that for the moment. It went well in rehearsal. Let's hit edit, undo that brush stroke. Okay. For the most part, our mask is still up in the sky. If I look at it again, you'll notice it's there. Now, as I begin to play with other adjustments, notice I can darken the sky, but not the mountains. So I can work on this in any other tools that I use while I am using that mask will work. So I could say, bring the texture up a little bit, maybe a little clarity. Let's make the sky a little bluer. Maybe a touch of dehaze, too much. Dehaze, by the way, will add saturation. So that's the case. I'm, I'm pretty good with that. So now I was able to change the sky, but not the mountains. So that is hopefully, um, Linda, that answered your question. You don't always have to use, let's, Let's, um, let's go to this one. You don't have to use the graduated filter. You can use other tools that you might. For instance, you can just use the regular brush. I'm going to turn on the mask so I can see where the brush is painted. Exposure's way down. And we're just going to paint all over there. And the reason that's showing up green is because I've turned on the mask overlay. Depending on the picture you're working with, green may not be easy to see. Say you were working on a picture of trees or something, you can change the color of the mask overlay by holding shift and clicking O. Now the mask overlay is white, now it's black, now it's red, so forth. So shift O will change the color of your overlay. So whatever is easiest for you to work with. Now I've, that I've painted that with that, I can come down here, come to the range mask, turn on luminance, uh, go to show the luminance mask, and the same thing we did before, we want to keep it on the whiter parts, so let's come up like this. We're going to bring down smooth this a little bit. Okay, and let's turn this off now. And because I've got this yanked way down below, it's gone a little beyond, you know, all reason. But you can see that I'm only affecting the sky and not the mountain. So whether I put the mask on initially with the brush or the uh, graduated filter, or I could even put it on with a radial filter if I did for whatever reason, that's how you incorporate both those and using luminance mask. Let's reset that and maybe this will work for us if we're got better luck than we've had so far. Let's do the same thing here. Let's paint on a mask. I'm gonna bring down exposure, not here, with my brush, just so I can see where I'm working. So I've loaded the brush with exposure. Let's paint that completely over there. I can turn that on too if I want to see. All right. You noticed when we went down here, we had both luminance and color. If I pick color mask, and let's turn this off so I can see what I'm doing, and also bring that back. color mask. Okay, see the little eyedropper tool? What I am using that for is I am saying, okay, I want you to mask based on colors in the scene. Well, in this particular scene, we're pretty fortunate 
that the mountains are, are quite red and the sky is blue. So say we want to mask the mountains. If I pick this dropper and I click on the red and I click multiple spots in the red, I think I might have to hold down the shift key. Yeah. I am sampling various colors of the red. And now when I turn on the mask, let's put the dropper back and let's see if it worked. There we go. Notice because I sampled the red, it said, okay, I'm only gonna affect the colors that are red that I initially painted on. So if I wanted the, the mountains to be darker or lighter or whatever, by sampling a particular color range, whatever is in within that color range, when I clicked multiple spots around here, it picked up the red and said, use that to build my mask. So depending on the colors that are in your image, that can be very useful too. So hopefully that all made sense. Hey, Rick. Let's move along. Uh, let me look at the chat if I can do that. Been a while since I've looked at that. If I can make that come back. Oh, can't seem to get my chat window back. All right, we'll worry about that in a minute. Okay, um, I had another question from Dave Fuji, AK Akira. And Dave asked me, when is it time to jump out of Lightroom and go to Photoshop? And basically, I stay in Lightroom as long as I can to uh, until I hit something that I do not have a tool to change with Lightroom. So let's use this picture, which has some things and it's nothing special, but it helps illustrate maybe why you would go to Photoshop. Say I want to square this pic, this window up a little bit more. I can come down to transform here, open that up. And I can either use the existing tools and say, transform that vertically to square that up a little bit more. Or the other one that I sometimes like to use is this one called guided. When I click guided, I can run a line on what I say should be vertical lines. So those two window lines that way, and this horizontal line this way, and now that's much more square than when I started out. There's the, the after, there's the before. So you can see I used the transform tool to square that up. Photoshop does that maybe a little better, but hey, I can do it in Lightroom as well. Now, say I wanted to do some other things in this photo. I wanted to fix the broken window. So it's not broken, it looks like that. Could I do that here? Not so much. That's kind of a clone operation. There are some clone type tools here and I could maybe attempt to, let's see if I can zoom out a little bit using this tool, the spot removal tool. I could come in and say, all right, pick this section here. That's the broken window and repair it from this spot over here, the good window. And right now I'm in heal, so it's not working real good. Let's go to clone. Not bad, you know, if I played with it a little bit more. Here's another little tool, trick that I just learned, and this can be very useful and allow you to do more with the spot healing tool than you normally could. Let's go back and say, you know, this is okay, but it could use some fine tuning. Say I wanted to remove this little dot that's right in the middle, not this dot, but the little black dot right there. 
Well, the problem I get into is as soon as I take my spot healing tool and I move it to work over here, I'm on top of the one I just did before and I, I can't do anything. So this is, this is worth the price of admission tonight because this will greatly expand what you can do. If when you get ready to do that, you hold down the H key, H stands for hide. Now I can work on that little spot and continue to work on things. While it, now see that picked from a whole different spot, that last one I did. So we're going to undo that. But I could continue to work on places that have multiple layers of the tool. So you could, you know, I could come down and work in here and, you know, continue to work on it. Is it as good as Photoshop? Heck no. In Photoshop, what I would do if I wanted to fix that spot is I would make a selection around there and then there are various other ways I could clone from here. I could use the healing tool, so forth. But in a pinch, yeah, you can, you can have Lightroom do some of those things. Now, down in this area, say I wanted to make this part of the window, which has my reflection in it, not have my reflection in it, and look more like this up here. Uh, that would be a heck of a lot of work, and I don't know how successful I would be with Lightroom. But if you took it over to Photoshop, come on. Then you could do something like that. So that's, you know, when the answer, the simple answer to your question, Dave, when is it time to go to Photoshop? When you can't go any farther than with Lightroom and the tools you have. So that's about that. You will have far better cloning options, healing options, warping, transform, more precision with your brush. Lightroom or Photoshop is just a more precise tool because of the, the tools that have, but not to, not to slight Lightroom. I, I can do 80 to 90% of my work in Lightroom and maybe only 10% in Photoshop. So that's that. Okay, let's jump into another question I had. And the reason I have all these photos up here. Somebody asked me about batch processing. Batch processing says, okay, I want to edit this photo, and then I want that edit to apply to all the rest. These photos all happen to be years ago when I was working for state police, they wanted to do a yearbook. And so I went around to all our district offices and I took pictures of all our employees. And they, of course, in a yearbook, you want all the photos to match as closely as possible. So I set up, I made sure I used a prime lens so I couldn't zoom. I set the camera the same distance for every photo. I set the lights the same. I did everything when I shot it to make them as close as possible. Then the other thing I needed to do is I needed to come back and be able to know who these people were because I needed to identify them in the book. So what we did is we set up a chair in front of them with their name and their, all their information on it. But I didn't want that, that in the yearbook. I, you know, that was just reference information. So later on when I got back, I knew who this guy was. So what I'm going to do is edit this photo and then without having to edit how, you know, the dozens of more that are essentially the same, I'm going to do a kind of a batch edit operation. So let's do a real quickie. This image is pretty close to where I want it to be. We're going to come into lens corrections, check those two. I'm going to come into basic, check auto. And you know, I'm pretty, I'm not going to drag this out. I'm pretty happy with that just from the get go. We decided for the yearbook, we wanted a four by six aspect ratio, which is the default of what this is. And we wanted headshots to look about like that. Pretty close. This particular guy kind of had his head tilted sideways. I want his hat to be level. I'm going to twist a little bit and I'm going to say done. So then, okay. Pretty good. Now, 
what if I want to do that to all these other photos? And I don't want to have to go through that process on every single one. Well, what you do is with the first one selected, let's come down to about here. You can see down here on the toolbar or the uh, um, toolbar, what do they call that? The panel, whatever it is. Anyway, I click the first one. I click the last one. Now I click this word sync. And what it's going to do is, let me drag this over to the screen where you can see it. This comes up and it says, okay, what settings do you want to sync? If I check all, which is what it came up with, all these things will be copied over as they exist in the first photo to all these other photos. Or I could say, you know, no, the only thing I want you to do is crop. So I could check, click none and do crop or whichever ones I want. I'm going to go back and check, check all just because, and then I'm going to click synchronize. And what will start to happen is notice now all these other images down across the bottom, it picked up the attributes of the very first one. Are they perfect and are they done? Maybe not, but they're a whole lot closer. So now if I go to the first one and I say, well, that was good, but this guy wasn't as tall. All I have to do is move him up a little in the frame and he wasn't have his head twisted so much bam, I'm done. The next one, and I took two photos of every person just in case they close their eyes on one. So this guy's photo and the very next photo, it's pretty close. So if, let me first of all hit it, select none. We'll click this one, which is the one that we liked. And then the next one, and I can say, okay, come on. Make this one, the same as the one I just did, if I hit previous, it says, okay, do it exactly like the one before it. I could use previous on this if I thought it would match well and so forth. But anyway, the, the idea without staying on that for a long time is when you use the sync option, you can work on one photo and if your others are essentially or very close to being the same, you don't have to go through such a long edit process on all the subsequent photos. You can also do something like this. Say I have this photo selected and instead I hit copy and then you get the same sort of thing. So I hit copy. Now let's come way down here and because that's loaded into my copy buffer, if I hit paste, now that photo takes on the attributes. So I can just simply go through my photos, pick the next one, and we know usually the shortcut for paste, control V. Oh, come on, it is, it's not control V in this program? All right, paste. Anyway, we'll do it the other way. And this, this guy sat a little higher so we can, you know, adjust him up, so forth, and done. The advantage of doing it that way for this project is my crop stayed about the same. I was the same distance. And so later when we got done with the yearbook, all the head sizes were all pretty close to the same. If I had gone in and done this manually with the crop tool, and then I said, yeah, okay, you know, this looks pretty good for this one. And then I, you know, okay. If I did it manually, the crop sizes would be different and the heads wouldn't match. So that's, that's another reason for doing it that way. Let me dive out of this a second. I'm, my weakness here is I, there we go. All right, I'm looking at the chat window. Um, okay, good. I don't see any big questions. I appreciate the compliments, folks. A little cheering never hurts. Um, good. All right, time-wise, let's get through some more. So we talked about batch processing, okay. 
Linda asked more than one question, and that's great. Linda asked sharpening. Let's talk about sharpening. Let's go to another photo. Uh, let's come down here. Okay. I'm not going to take this one all through the edit because I just mainly want to talk about sharpening and how do you sharpen and how much is too much and so forth and so on. So um, just for grins before and after. Get back to the original. This is the edited one. Okay. Detail is where sharpening lives in Lightroom. And you'll see sharpening right here. Let's double click through all these. In fact, if I double click on the, eh, that should work, but it doesn't. Come on. Now the computer's chewing on something and hopefully we'll get back. You guys all disappeared. That's not a good sign. Okay, hanging on. Okay, I think we're back. All right. This is a formula that I learned from learning Lightroom. Are we good? Are we back? My computer seems to be having some issues. Mary, I see you in the top corner. Back again? Nod? Good. Okay. Um, all right. So we're under the detail tab. We have sharpening. This was a recipe that I learned from... Um, Hey, Rick, we can't see. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Hang on. Thank you. Mo better? Good. Okay. All right. This particular photo over in sharpening. This was a recipe that I learned when I learned how to edit in Lightroom from watching Serge Ramelli videos. And this is what he did. First of all, when we start to get into sharpening, notice this little exclamation point up here. And if I hover, click it, no, not click it, come back. It should give me the message when I hover it. We are having our share of technical difficulties tonight. There we go. Hopefully you can read that. If I go hover the exclamation point, it says for a more it did. For a more accurate preview, zoom the preview size to 100% or larger when adjusting the controls in this panel. What it's saying is you're not going to be able to do good sharpening unless you can really see what you're doing. So I can either come up here and, and size it up, or if I click the little exclamation point, if my computer will cooperate, and then up here in the navigator window, that's what this is called. I can move this little box over to whatever I want to look at. So let's move it over where the trees are and give my computer a, sec a chance to refresh that. Right now it's very pixelated. I seem to be having memory issues, not me, but the computer, maybe both. Oh, come on. Well, hopefully that will repaint the picture. Come on. Time to buy a new computer. Anyway, if this is going to work for us. Anyway, while that hopefully refreshes the screen, I will tell you where I'm going. Hopefully you can hear me as well because I got all kinds of things flashing on the screen and things happening behind the scenes here. Anyway, Serge Ramelli, his recipe is he will take the amount of sharpening and the noise reduction and those two numbers he wants to add to 100 when he uses both of them. So for instance, if I brought up noise reduction here to 20, 
I could come up sharpening to 80, those 20 plus 80 equals 100. And that was, I don't know why that works and why that's his recipe, but it seems to work for me. So that's what I do. If I want to put that on 100 exactly, and it's not important just so it's close, I can click in the little box where the number is and type in whatever I want, not 100, I, I said 80. There. Okay, now, uh, it would appear to me, as I look at this now that this is up close and personal, and this has been a long time since I took this picture, that this was taken on a windy night because this branch seems to be blowing, but this one is sharp. So this may not be the best example, but anyway, I set my noise reduction to 20 and I set my sharpening to 80. Now, something else that you want to do when you apply sharpening in Lightroom is you don't want to sharpen areas that don't really have any detail in them anyway. This is jumping around. We're having good fun here. All right. So that's what this masking tool is for down here. And if I put my cursor on the mask tool, hold down Alt and drag the mask up, you will begin to see, hopefully if my computer, okay. Everything that is white will get sharpened. Everything that is black will not get sharpened. And that's what I want. I don't want to sharpen in areas where like the sky, no sharpening is required because all that will do is if there is noise there, it will sharpen the noise. So I'm gonna put that about there and I'm gonna release that. And now the sky is much cleaner and this detail is sharpened about where I want. So use masking in conjunction with um, the amount and the luminance noise reduction. Very rarely will you see color noise. If you start to see little speckles, where you may see color noise a little bit more, let's see if we see any down here, if I can get there. My computer is beginning to struggle. We may have to wind this up, I think. I think we're running low on memory or something weird is happening. All right, let's come out of here. Anyway, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, color noise, which is what this is down here, this slider. You will sometimes see color noise if you brightened up some really dark areas. And what color noise is, is little speckles of color is, is sort of what it looks like. And if you see them, you can bring this slider up. I have usually found that it doesn't hurt to bring it up. If there's no color noise there, no harm, no foul. It doesn't do anything. So play with that if you want. I don't use it a lot. Let's come out of here, get into something maybe that doesn't cause my computer to choke. <laughs> Although I'm not sure what that is right now. Let's come out of the share. Check our... <laughs> Yeah, I need mega RAM, I do. All right. Um, we got time for a couple more. I think we'll go till 8.30. Maybe I'll do one more. I think you got your five and then you're gonna get maybe a few more than that. So that's okay. Let's come to presets. Somebody asked me one time, presets, what are they? So forth. You will find that presets are something that a lot of places online want to sell you. Let's come back to here and here, and hopefully you're now seeing my Lightroom screen again. But over here in presets. Presets are essentially recipes that control the sliders. They're, they're a list of slider settings is essentially what they are. So the reason that people will sell them is they'll develop 
certain looks and all they've really done is come over to the sliders, made a bunch of adjustments and then save those as a preset. So let's take a look at one in example here. Let's go to a black and white preset, the black and white preset tab and you'll notice I get different, different options. And as I hover them, it shows me what the picture is going to look like if I apply that preset. So let's pick this. I don't like that one. Let's see if we find one that we even think is nice. Okay, close enough. I'll go with that one, black and white split tone. But if I click that, what it's going to do, actually it went to something else now, which I don't like, but no matter. If I come over here to basic, let's pick a different one just so you can watch my sliders when I click one. Notice they all move because what's happened is within the preset, it's saved the recipe for the sliders. So that's what presets essentially are. They are different recipes that you can apply to your photo uh, to give it different looks. Preset meaning they're pre-developed. If I go, no, I don't like that one, I can hit edit undo and it will go back to wherever I went. I think I had a couple before that. So, you know, I could either keep stepping back through them or if I didn't want to do that, I could come to my history and come down here before I started monkeying with all that. So we're back to the color. Now, that having been said, say this particular picture with all the things I've done to it, I thought, you know, I kind of like that. I might want to apply that to other pictures in the future. I can make my own preset. If I come and click the plus sign and click create preset, now I can give it whatever name I want. Let's call this Rick's Moab Sunset. Okay, name it whatever you want. I can choose to have all these things as part of the preset or pick and choose as I want. Let's just say all create. And now over here, you will find them under user presets. Uh, hopefully. There it is, jumping around. Rick's Moab Sunset. So let's come back over to a different photo. Now if I come over here, I don't know how this is going to look, but we'll see. I can use the preset and apply it to this photo. And there we go. So that's essentially what presets are. They are recipes. You can use somebody else's recipe or you can develop your own. And there are a way with one click, you can essentially copy a look from one photo to others. I'm going to stop the share. We're back here. Um, hopefully everybody, I still see names. So in fact, um, feel free to jump in, unmute your mic if you want to ask a question or let me know you're still there or whatever. I see names, but I don't hear anybody. <laughs> Did we crash all together? No, we're still here, Rick. Okay, good. Good, good, good. Sometimes, like I say, this reminds me of my radio days when you'd sit in front of a microphone and, you know, you just broadcast out to the void and hope that somebody was hearing you. So, good. Um, I had... Half a dozen other things we could get into, but in the interest of time, uh, we got another eight minutes, as long as I'm still getting out there. Hi, Rick. Let's talk. Barbara. What's that? Is Barbara. 
Yeah. I have a question. Sure. So if you buy someone's presets and use them in your photo and then you go to sell your photo, do they have any rights or once you buy that preset, then you own it? Uh, hopefully everybody heard the question. Barbara asked, if you buy presets from somebody else, apply them to your photo, does the person who developed the presets have any right to your photo? No, because all the presets are, are slider settings. And they sell you the preset with the idea that that's what you're going to use it for. You're going to use it to adjust your photos. If that is the case, I'd be very surprised. Anybody else with a question either in the chat or audio wise? I got maybe one or two other things we can touch on if you want to hang in there. Hey, I'm Rick. Still good to go. Yeah, Giuseppe. Yeah, um, going back to moving things to a smart collection, if you hit the letter B, when you have a picture in front of you, it automatically goes to the collection. Uh, you're telling me about a shortcut to add a photo to the smart collection? Right. When you uh, use the letter B, it will tell you that it's been added to the automatic to the collection. I, I wouldn't doubt that there is a, a shortcut. There's a shortcut for everything in Photoshop and Lightroom. I'm just not kind of a shortcut guy. I haven't memorized all the shortcuts. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. That was great. Sure. Let's, um, there was one more I put a star. Oh, I talked about the clone over clone spot. Let me, let me hit that again because it's one that I just learned like today. And I went, wow, this is, this is so good. It's something I wanted to do. Let's uh, undo the preset that went on this photo and we can, we can do it here. Say I wanted to get rid of this little sign that's down the road. Okay. I can use the spot removal tool. I think you need I to show the screen, Rick. I can come over this and... Uh, we're not seeing your screen, Rick. Nope. I keep forgetting to do that. Hang on. Okay, better? Yeah, that works. Good. All right, let me undo that and we'll start again. Maybe. Maybe. Longer, does, does your computer run out of RAM the longer you work? <laughs> anyway, back to the spot removal tool. Here's the sign I want to get rid of. We're going to just paint right over it and make sure we get the little legs down here and so forth. And it goes over and it says, I'm going to pick from a different spot. Sometimes Lightroom can be kind of stupid about where it picks from. And it's off the screen here. So I'm going to hold down the shift key or the uh, space bar and the space bar then becomes a hand and you can see where it picked from. I don't like that particular spot. So I'm going to let it come back over here and say, no, I'll pick from over here instead. Well, certainly not on the bush. Keep coming. There we go. Now, one of the reasons that it's not done a very good job is notice up here, the difference between clone and heal. Clone makes an exact copy. And usually it's like a, a patch on a tire. It, it's very obvious. So heal will sometimes be the better of the two options. So let's see if that will, there we go. And we'll say done. And now the sign is gone. So you can use the spot removal tool, which is the closest thing that Lightroom has to uh, the healing brush or cloning or some of those more sophisticated things you can do in uh, Photoshop. But the one that I mentioned before, and I'm going to mention it again, because I thought this was so cool. The, the problem I always ran into was when I laid down a repair and I wanted to work again or do some further tuning in that same spot. This was the thing I picked up today. If you 
hold down the H key, that allows you to come back and work more in that same spot. And where this can become very useful is if you're working with something that's more complex than maybe you could normally do in Lightroom, the term I guess I would best use is you can nibble away at that spot and keep working on it and working on it and refining it some more. Uh, let's see if I can find another example down here. Let's come down on the road. This may or may not be a good example. Say I come in here and I wanted to get rid of part of this yellow stripe. And we're going to let it pick from over here and so forth. And now I want to continue to work there. I hold down the H key and now I'm free to continue to work in other spots, even though they may overlap. And I'm starting to play with this more and more and find out that maybe the clone tool can be used for more sophisticated fixes than you could normally do in Lightroom. So that's, that one's for free. That's the one I learned today. And hopefully that uh, will be something you will play with if you've not tried before. It was a, a revelation for me and I'm going to try and use it a little bit more. So it's almost 830. I think that's enough punishment for tonight. Let's stop the share. And unless there's any last minute questions, comments, or anything else, we'll call it a night. And I appreciate you all coming out and take care of yourselves. And hopefully we're going to do this uh, in front of people. Uh, I'm not sure if it's more embarrassing to have technical difficulties this way or live. Neither one is much fun. So I apologize for those. That's uh, some computer quirks we had tonight. But hopefully you learned something. And we will see you all down the road. So thanks for joining in, folks. And bye for now.